Dolphins are one of the most popular animals in the world. They're graceful in the water, beautiful to watch, and they seem so happy to see you. But despite their popularity, there is still much about the dolphin world we just don't understand. Early each summer morning, the dolphin research team from Savannah State University is on the hunt. They spend hours searching for something that may surprise you. Dr. Tara Cox says dolphins off the coast of Georgia are begging for food, like a spoiled dog at the dinner table. What is begging? What, what constitutes begging behavior? What should we be looking for? So it's a very specific behavior where they're coming within two meters of the boat with their, um, either on their ventral surface or within 10 meters with their head up and with their mouth open. So essentially, you'll be able to tell it when you see it because they're essentially asking us for food. Got it. We took her up on an offer to witness this behavior. Bottlenose dolphins swim in the creeks, rivers, and open sea. So Tara and her team divided the coast into sections that they check on a regular basis. So this is the area, so we're here, and we're coming out Country Club Creek, and then we'll go to the Herb River, and then this is um, Thunderbolt, the Wilmington River, um, goes out here to Wausau Sound. So that's okay. actually where we're gonna head. We're all on the lookout for bottlenose dolphins. But it's a lot harder than you might think. Right here, one o'clock, one o'clock. The water is a problem. Georgia has beautiful marshes, but when the tide goes out, it pulls sediment from those grasses, which makes the water murky. It's kind of like searching for torpedoes speeding through chocolate milk. And you never know where a dolphin might pop up. That social, whoop, oh. It is a photographer's nightmare. It takes a while to determine if a dolphin is merely curious about what you are or if it wants to engage. But once you see a beggar, it's pretty obvious. Feed me. Come on. I'm adorable. Tara's team has spent years documenting this kind of behavior off the coast of Georgia. Regardless of whether dolphins beg, they take photos of dorsal fins from each one they encounter. Yeah, let's just do that one more time. Those fins are like fingerprints so eventually, they begin to recognize many of the dolphins by sight. You can tell the dolphins that have not been fed. They may check you out, but most of the time, they simply ignore the boat. We expect to see some begging around shrimp boats, 
But instead, the dolphins here are just having some rough social interaction. We think between male and female. After watching for a while, we head out for Wausau Island, a national wildlife refuge that is only accessible by boat. There's no development here, so it would be strange to see a dolphin beg. But here he comes. Just watch the routine. It is unbelievable. This goes on for at least 20 minutes. Even though it is against federal law to feed dolphins, this would be hard for a lot of folks to resist. And it's obvious, this guy is used to getting handouts. So they stayed with us and he was really persistent. He came up multiple times. Usually after a time or two, they realize, oh, you're not gonna feed me, I'll move on. And this animal was very persistent. That tells me that it is being fed pretty often. Nearby, there is a female with her young calf. Because dolphins are such social animals, they learn from each other. So that mother and calf may turn into beggars as well. The moms are teaching the young. So we also had a mom who was begging with her calf uh, two years ago. It was, a very, it was a very aggressive beggar. And that, then that calf, when it was time to wean, ended up dead on the beach in Tybee. And it had multiple injuries. It had half a fluke as a calf. So three years old, it had half a fluke. It had shark bite scars all over it, likely from following trawlers. Um, and it was emaciated, so it, it, it was malnourished. And so that was the most striking example to us of what can happen. Back in Tara's lab, all the photos are cataloged. It's part of a mid-Atlantic effort to keep track of dolphins from Virginia to Florida. Tara's search indicates that our freeloading dolphin has been spotted before. This um, picture right here is from our catalog. So the best pictures go into our catalog and we can identify the individuals by Nick's patterns of nicks and notches. So and you know this dolphin. We know this dolphin. This dolphin actually we saw for the first time in the same place we saw him. Um, and we saw him in 2009, and we have seen, I say him, we don't know, him or her, um, ever since 2009. And the first time we ever saw him, he was begging, and then obviously he was begging when we were out there. Georgia isn't the only place with begging dolphins. Check out these video clips from Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. you can see the potential danger to both the dolphins and those who feed them. Dolphins do bite on occasion, especially if they're being teased. Dolphins already face threats from being in the water with so many boats. That's one reason they have all those nicks and notches on their dorsal fins. But if they purposely approach the back of a boat for a handout, they are at an even greater risk to be killed by a boat strike.
The first time many of us see a dolphin is at a facility like Georgia Aquarium's Marineland or on television. And they're just so daggone cute. It looks like they want to be your friend. So if one comes up to your boat, it's very tempting to give them food or reach out and try to pet them. <laughs> Do you want to be my friend? <laughs> But senior trainer Andy Horn says, if you're feeding a dolphin, you are teaching it to depend on humans for food. Just like the ones at Marineland. The dolphins here get 10 to 30 pounds of fresh fish a day, not chips or hot dogs, not fish bait that's been sitting out all day. Hey, big girl, how are you doing this morning? So big, now is she looking at us? She is. Now, dolphins actually have monocular vision, which means that they can see in multiple directions at the same time. So she can be looking at you, be looking at me with each eye at the same time. Um, it's a good adaptation, again, for them living in a three-dimensional environment where they might have to see things above them, below them, behind them, in front of them, all coordinating at the same time. We came here to show you these mammals up close. Their anatomy is simply amazing. Now, what are you doing? You're just giving her a signal? Yeah, what I'm asking her to do is show us her belly. Oh, my goodness. So this is her belly right here. Now, of course, these guys are mammals, so this is evidence of her live birth. This is her belly button right here. Wow. Right there in the middle. If you, if you want to reach out and feel, Sharon, um, you'll notice that her top layer of skin is shedding off. It's called sloughing, and what that oh, allows yeah, the dolphins to do is stay hydrodynamic in the water. This feels really weird. It's like grit on her belly that comes off with your hand. Keeps the skin nice and smooth so the water rushes over them and produces very little drag. And that'll happen every two hours. You heard that right. Dolphins are shedding belly skin every two hours. Throughout the morning, Andy interacts with the dolphin by doing nothing more than moving his hand. When they um, jump up, we, of course, can ask her for that behavior. So she knows a signal where I can ask her to jump. Good girl. And of course, you can see the height on her jump. These guys can get up to 16 feet. And of course, they do that on their own time, too, as they're socializing, as they're playing, as they're interacting. Yeah, how do they jump up and spin around and do all that? Yeah. Because they do that in the wild. Yes, they do when they're chasing, playing, hunting uh, prey items. This is called her peduncle here. It's a series of muscles, almost spring-loaded. So it takes very little effort for her to flick that tail. These are called the flukes here. This is what propels her through the water, allows for the displacement of the water. They also have a very complex system of hearing and communicating. The actual ear is in a small pinhole buried in blubber near the eye. Bottlenose dolphins have a hollow jawbone that allows them to feel vibrations. It acts like a receptor for sound, and the noises they hear then run up the jaw to their ear. That blowhole there, right where she took a breath, is also where she produces sounds. Can you show us some of those sounds, big girl? Huh? What about this one? Yeah, OK, very good. <laughs> those all are manipulated by the muscles inside of that blowhole. Now, when they're using echolocation, they send those sounds through this blubbery forehead right here. They'll bounce off an object, come back and hit her in her, basically what's her radar antenna, this jaw right here. Those images go up to her ear, and she can process a variety of information of things that she observes in her environment. It's important to make the difference between animals in human care and dolphins in the ocean where we might be interfering with their natural behavior if we were to try to interact with them in a way like this. That's actually why it's illegal in the United States to interact with dolphins or any marine mammal out in the ocean due to the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. Internationally known dolphin researcher Randy Wells has spent most of his life trying to understand how dolphins communicate with each other. He has determined that each dolphin has a signature whistle. What's been determined over time is that this whistle serves as a name. So while the dolphin may produce a whole variety of whistles, 
it'll produce its signature whistle when it's trying to stay in contact with other individuals. Another dolphin may produce that dolphin's signature whistle to get in contact with it. It truly does serve as a name for the individual in a very abstract concept, in a context, which is not something that is seen frequently in the animal kingdom. Randy heads the longest running study of wild dolphins in the world at Moat Marine Laboratory. 43 years monitoring dolphins around Sarasota, Florida. He's worked with Tara Cox in Savannah as well, and like her, he worries about the impact of human interaction. These animals face a lot of threats from recreational fishing gear. Lynn, can you back up like one foot? Yeah, sure. They face threats from boat traffic, pollution. They face threats from being fed and provisioned by humans. They face contaminant threats. These are all things that are not really taken into account under the Marine Mammal Protection Act at this point to the extent that it can be used to provide management guidance. Randy is part of a team that tested dolphins off the coast of Georgia around Brunswick and Sapelo Island. Um. What that team discovered shocked everyone. Some of the dolphins tested had the highest level of PCBs ever found in a marine mammal. PCBs, or polychlorinated biphenyls, were banned in 1979 because of their toxic impact on wildlife and humans. So now, scientists are trying to figure out why such high levels show up decades later off the coast of Georgia. <laughs> State biologist Clay George is co-author of a published report on the issue and believes the PCBs are from the former LCP chemicals now a Superfund site in Brunswick. One of the things that was so, such a, a, a unique situation here in the Brunswick case was that the PCB levels are so much higher. Um, basically, the PCB levels we're dealing with are higher than has ever been documented in any, in any marine mammals in the world. And so um, if you were going to see impacts, then it would likely occur here. And that's exactly uh, what we found. We found that about a, a quarter of the animals that we captured were clinically anemic. We found um, low rates of thyroid hormones. Um, we found low immune response in these animals. I joined Clay and his photographer, Kate Sparks, on their daily survey. As with most dolphin studies, taking photos of dorsal fins helps identify a population. The boat is small, so I'll be the official recorder today. BSS is one. Temp and salinity are blank. Depth is six. And okay, she's ready for a photo. These are long days spent on the water taking photo after photo, just trying to determine how dolphins 30 miles away from Brunswick have high levels of PCBs. The concerning part really, other than just you know, the impacts it has on these dolphins, is that it's been seen in, in dolphins all the way up to, say, Sapelo, which is yeah, you know, right. 30 miles from here. And so the question then becomes, how did it get in those, in those dolphins? Did those dolphins spend time in Brunswick at some point in their life? Uh, did fish migrate from this area to that area and then get eaten by dolphins in that location? And so there's, just like a lot of research, um, there's almost more questions now. Dolphins are always on the hunt for food, so determining what and where they eat is a big part of the puzzle. Some dolphins stun a fish with their fins and eat it whole. Dumber, dumber. 
Often, they work together, creating a wave to get a school of fish near the shore. Sometimes you can see them speeding through the water after a school of mullet, fish flying up in the air, water splashing, all in a matter of seconds. That's why all this tedious research is taking place. What are they eating? Where are they eating it? Which dolphins spend all their time in one neighborhood? And how many move up and down the coast? Is it really worth the time and money to find out? They're breathing the same air that we're breathing. They're eating the same fish that we're catching. They're swimming through the same waters that we swim in. And they're exposed to the same sorts of threats that the humans are in the same area. In some cases, they're exposed to it to a greater extent. Anything that's going to happen as a result of threats to the coastal environment are going to hit these animals first, and they can be telling us ahead of time what we need to be concerned about. There are more than 30 species of dolphins, striped, spotted, Hard to believe, but giant orcas, killer whales, are part of the dolphin family. Yet, the bottlenose dolphin is perhaps best known to those who live on the East Coast. People stop what they're doing just to watch them swim by. Since they are mammals, they have to come up for air, often making silvery arched ribbons along the tidal creeks. Some believe dolphins have healing powers, and there are many stories over the centuries about them saving people in trouble at sea. Without a doubt, they are a very special part of our environment. For those who dedicate their lives to understanding these marine mammals, there may always be more questions than answers. Dolphins are fascinating to me. They are a way to understand what goes on in the sea. They're a top-level predator. They're a very complex organism that has evolved in the complexity of their social systems to respond to the, the situations they face in an oceanic environment. And understanding how this came about is something that's very interesting to a guy who grew up in the middle of Illinois and wanted to get out and see the world and, and understand what goes on in, in habitats that were very different from the, the farmland. It's amazing because they actually, people call them the rats of the sea because they are the marine mammal we know the most about. And yet, we still know so little about them, especially here in Georgia. There's just these big black holes of, we don't even know who they are. There's, you know, just different things that, that we do as humans that impact a whole host of, sp of species. And um, there's a limited amount of resources out there to, to do this type of work, and we really need to focus on the areas where we can make a difference. You think you can make a difference here? Yeah, for sure. Aristotle studied dolphins more than 2,000 years ago. He wrote, the voice of the dolphin in air is like that of the human, in that they can pronounce vowels and combinations of vowels. What if those early observations turn out to be right?
Researchers all along the East Coast continue seeking answers to the many questions about bottlenose dolphins. Unfortunately, those studies may take decades before there are any results. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time.